this is Pastor Ken Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida, inviting you to our worship services at 8.30 and 10.30, and also to our Bible study. Right now, right now is the Bible study. We don't care what day or week it is or what time it is, but we're answering a particularly simple and yet very difficult and theological sentence question, and that is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? A Bible study. And let's get started. Jesus, true God and true man. This is a mystery, and it is revealed in John 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John, the apostle, has seen Jesus. He has been with him. He knew him face to face. And years later, he is reporting what happened when Jesus came into the world as a human being. The word became flesh. I shared this slide with you last week. It is one of the most beautiful in my opinion, because there are just the three of them. Mary, the mother, Joseph, the foster father, full of wonder, and the babe, Jesus. And they called his name Jesus, for he would save his people from their sins. Christmas is the celebration of God coming to us in human flesh. <coughs> that is the mystery of the ages, God coming to us. And one of the things that puzzle people is why? Why did God put on human flesh in order to do something for us that we couldn't do for ourselves? Jesus Christ is true God and true man. <coughs> we say when we are talking about things that matter, things that are, are mattering to us and uh, to others. Jesus Christ, true God and true man. So we have been in past lessons looking at the person and the works of Jesus toward the two points in the outline. One is the deity of Jesus Christ, that he is a God. No, he is the God. He is not one of many gods, but the true God. And when we say the deity of Jesus Christ, we're talking about the simple fact that Jesus was God and is God to this day. The second thing in this mystery is the humanity of Jesus Christ, which for us is a little easier to see. He is like us. Two hands, two feet. His face looked like the face of others in his day. You couldn't tell him from other Jews. You really couldn't. He didn't have a halo around him or anything like that. People followed him. But in the beginning, when he was born, he was known only to the angels and to uh, <laughs> uh, the hymns are, are, are fast becoming part of our current vocabulary to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay. The humanity of Jesus was known to them. And then to, to those who came about two years later, really, uh, those wise men from the East who came seeking the Christ. True God and true man, a mystery that has only to be received is only to be received by faith. You cannot reason it. You, you cannot find any other example in human history. This is Jesus Christ. Called Jesus because he would save his people from their sins and called Christ because he is the anointed one, the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. That's a summary. So we have this mystery. Jesus is true God and true man in one person. 
that's not just a little bit of theology. That is what the Bible says about him. The two natures are united in one. The two natures, human nature, which we could see if we were there, and um, the divinity, which was only revealed when Jesus wanted to make him known. These are not hitting. All right. There'd be none one there. Take them off. Okay. All right. I don't know. Yeah. See, oh, I wouldn't have been asking someone to mute their. Uh, yeah. Uh, mute their mic. Yeah. There's background conversation. Would you do that for us, please? Yeah, yeah. Jesus is true God and true man in one person. All right. Yeah, maybe questions so far? Okay. I was looking for uh, uh, the Clems, and that's usually where it is. Uh, they still haven't turned off the mic. I'll, I'll call them. Okay, thanks. I couldn't find the the mute button here. All right. Let's go on. Jesus Christ, true God and true man. And I want you to recall the two questions that we raised last time. What were the two questions? Anybody remember? I don't think so. The first was, why was it necessary? that Jesus Christ be true man. I don't want you to answer that now. I want you to hold that, hold that question as one of the two primary questions that we need to answer to talk about this union of two natures in Christ. Why did he have to be true man? And the second question is parallel to it. Why was it necessary that Jesus Christ be true God? Actually be God in the flesh. And the Bible answers these two questions. Thank you, John. Why was it necessary? The word necessary is kind of a God word because it means it was necessary for our salvation. It was necessary because of his plan for us. God did not dream this up uh, in, at the last minute. This was God's plan from the foundation of the world to save us. And the only way he could save us was by sending his only begotten son in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the answer to the question in one sentence. So let's take the first question up. And then if we have time, we'll get to the second question. Why did he have to be true man? I could have you list some guesses, but I want to go to the to the Bible with you. Okay? Well, let's, let's go to the Bible, and I'll ask you to read. Our lead-off reader is usually Judy, if she's well, if she's welcome. She is welcome if she's ready. <laughs> and here it is. Jesus redeemed us from sin, making the payment that we owed. Hmm. Mark 11, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Ransom. We were enslaved to sin. The whole human race was enslaved to human sin as, as, as owed. We owed something and no one could pay the price except Jesus. He made the payment that all of us owed. That's a difficult concept at times. I don't feel like I owed anything, but when I review my life against the requirements that God has laid down, I realize how much I owed for my actual sins and for the sin that I received uh, when I was born from my parents and they from their parents all the way back to Adam and Eve. That's a difficult thing for many people to believe, but it's in the scriptures. Jesus redeemed us. Next reader, Jesus suffered and died in our stead. In our stead. Hebrews 2, 14. 
Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. All right. He did that. Yeah. He took on himself that death that we owed. And by doing so, he was able, through that death, to destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Next reader, Jesus redeemed us from sin, again. I can do it. Okay, Joanne. Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Wow. You realize the connection between the cross and how he redeemed us by taking that curse and he fulfilled an Old Testament prophecy that everyone who hangs upon a tree is considered by those who watched the crucifixion to be cursed of God. Well, he committed no sin, and neither was any guile found in his mouth. Hmm. But he took the curse, and everyone who looked at him on the cross saw that, that sentence written on, on the cross. You see, folks, that the the comparison here is for Jesus to become for us what we could never do for ourselves. Otherwise, we all would be cursed by God. But when it says he became a curse for us, that's that idea of doing it in our stead, in our place. And before I forget, I want to welcome uh, Steve, who is with us this morning. Welcome, Steve. It's good to see you. All right, let's go on. Pastor, before you go on, can you explain a little uh, more, even though you did pretty thoroughly, but I just didn't want to pass over it. Cursed is everyone who hanged on a tree. So yeah. I, I know you explained what Christ did for us, but what? how did that originate? That's in the Old Testament. I can't give you the passage off the top of my head, but yeah. the, the you're re referring to the idea of a tree. No, the cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. Uh, I would have to go back in the Old Testament and look that up and give you the background. Yeah, I don't have that handy. I'm sorry that I don't. No, that's okay. Uh, if you do have a Bible and have a cross reference, um, uh, you can you can look that up. Now, since, since, you know, uh, since I have a Bible here, 313, and it turns rather easily to 313, then I can look at the cross references in Deuteronomy 21.23. Deuteronomy 21.23. Okay. Uh, and if you have a Bible, look that up for us, please. Deuteronomy 21.23. Yes. And uh, we'll just we just sit right here. Actually, I can I can do. Want me to read it? Yes. Well, I've got it here too. I think his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt surely bury him the same day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, and thou defile not thy land which Jehovah thy God giveth thee for inheritance. Mm -hmm. ASV oh. version. Um, all here's, here's the, the notes, if I could say, the notes in the, it's, it's the um, Lutheran Study Bible. Go ahead. Well, there's, there's actually maybe too many notes, but to deter crime, this is one of them. Ancient Near Eastern cultures would often display the corpse of executed criminals by hanging or impaling them mm -hmm. uh, publicly as a visual statement that justice was upheld. So the next one, the next one is specifically for that. A hanged man is cursed by God 
the body was accursed on account of the capital crime. Right. Okay, I see it. The New Testament uses this verse to describe Christ's work for us. And then down here further in the next little uh, 23, executed criminals are not to be left hanging, but must be buried the same day. Hmm. They are cursed by God and will defile God's gift, the land of promise, which God had hallowed. God gave Israel and us the gift of, and then it goes on. So I see some of it. It, it was a practice, which we know, I'm, but it, it gives a little more in here. I didn't never know where that came from. I think you've given us uh, what we needed. And the main thing was that G Jesus was guilty of nothing, but God the Father allowed him to suffer the curse of the capital crime, which was, and this is the biggie, the capital crime that all people owed God for their sin. Before Jesus, during Jesus' time, and ever since. So he took the entire curse. And when, when the sentence was pronounced upon him, it was God who was pronouncing the sentence. The religious leaders thought they were doing it. The Romans thought they were doing it. But it was God's plan from the beginning to redeem us from the curse of the law by putting his son on the tree of the cross. Now, when Peter talks about the cross in one of the places in 1 Peter, he uses the word tree there yeah. rather than the word cross. Hmm. He's very aware, Peter hmm. is, of the source of this idea of hanging on a tree. Okay, don't get any other image from early American history in your mind when you see this. <laughs> All right, I, I had to say it and then, then you got the picture, but I wanted to eliminate that because it has to do with the crucifixion. The mystery here, you know, we're on mysteries, I'll just bring up one more. When Deuteronomy 21 was written, no one knew anything about crucifixion. Oh. That was a punishment invented by the Romans, a terrible, terrible punishment, but a capital crime only. And the capital crime in Jesus' case, the one they accused him uh, of before the Roman authorities, you remember it, uh, was that he claimed to be a king. Yeah. We have no king but Caesar. All right, you crucify him. Forgot to start the timer again. Well, it was about 12 after. I think of these tangents, you don't have to. Thank you for, the, for this yeah. tangent, though. I'm glad that you asked the question. Let's go on with redemption from sin, 1 Peter 1. Okay, I guess I'll do that. 1 Peter 1. 18 to 19, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. That is beautiful. Yes. Mm. This is what Luther puts in his explanation to the second article of the creed not with silver or gold with it, but his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death that I might be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence and blessedness, even as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. You were ransomed from the futile ways the empty ways of the forefathers that, that based salvation by works. All right. Colossians 1 redeems from, Jesus redeems us from sin. Who else would like to read today? Carola? Yes. Would you read that please? Colossians 1, 13, 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, forgiveness of sins. Another beautiful passage. 
concerning yeah. Jesus. I don't think you think about it very much that, that you have been delivered, rescued, taken out of the domain of darkness. And you and I on all believers are in his kingdom, though we can't see it. And it's Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom of belonging to and coming out of the work of his son. And in him, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Welcome, Karen. It's good to have you among us. Jesus redeemed us from sin. Another passage about the redemption. Who would like to read here? Back around with Judy? Or is Steve, are you up here? Uh, Titus 2, verse 14. Jesus gave, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Redeemed from lawlessness. Lawlessness. Hmm. Ooh, that's a big, that covers a lot of territory. <laughs> sure does. The lawlessness against God's laws, which are plain and clear to everyone. No other gods but him do not use his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not covet. The lawlessness is against God's principles of life. To love him with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. It's really very simple to sum up, isn't it? But impossible for sinners like us to keep the law. So he bought us from that slavery to sin, to sin. And he purified for himself. He did the purifying. We couldn't. The people for his own possession. We belong to him. And aren't you and I zealous for good works? I know there's a few you left out yesterday. Forgive me, Lord. But your good works are known to God. He sees every one of them and he values them. He sees that you and I are zealous. We're eager, we're, we're after it. We're looking for something to do that benefits others. That's love. Jesus redeems us from sin, Romans 5, 19. Judy? Um, okay, I'll read it again. For as, for, my, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Yeah, remember we were talking uh, a couple of times ago, maybe three, uh, about how we don't have righteousness, but we must get it from outside of us. I was writing uh, uh, a bit of an essay to someone uh, a week ago about the alien righteousness. Alien. <laughs> alien means coming from outside of us. We needed a righteousness and we didn't have it. So how can we become righteous in God's sight? Remember I talked about the active obedience of Christ and the passive obedience of Christ. The active obedience of Christ consisted in this, that he kept every one of God's laws. Everyone. By his obedience, this passage from Paul's letter to the Romans says, by that man's obedience, many will be made righteous. And that's talking about us. Do you understand that? 
that yeah. that righteousness of Christ is transferred to us. It's like he put it in the bank and it was credited to our accounts by faith. I realized this morning when I was getting ready that there was a word that I had left out of the slides that belonged in it. I didn't have time to come in here and edit them. And I wanted to put it across every slide. We receive these truths by faith. By faith. This is not something that we figure out with our rational minds. It's not something we feel. I can't feel this. It gets declared to us by God through the Holy Scriptures. So you receive his righteousness. The only way anyone can do it, and that is by faith. When you believe in him as Savior. Is that clear? When I say things that are familiar to me, I don't know if they're familiar to you. I, I was just looking up righteousness because I was wondering if righteousness and grace were interchangeable. No. Uh, no, and they aren't. But uh, there's a little definition here. It says, what is seeking God's righteousness? To seek God's righteousness is normally portrayed as if we are not dedicated or holy enough. Wherefore, we must strive to perform better. However, Jesus said, seek his, God's righteousness, not our own self-righteousness. It is about us having been made righteous before God by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That's good. Uh, Don't I know can't. the purpose here. I, I can't manufacture my own righteousness. No. Uh, the second part of that is when we try. Uh, that's the, the period of our sanctification. That is when we are obedient to the extent that we are, we know and are able. So I'm, I, I'm flipping in my Bible to, to go to, to Philippians. I believe that's where I want to be. But I, I, I don't know whether I can find it without uh, looking for a while. Maybe another time. Well, there are a lot of good tangents this morning, and I like that. Jesus fully endured the wrath of God, which all mankind had earned by sin. First John 2, 2. Mm -hmm. I don't know that word. He is the... I'll say, it. I'll, I'll say it for everyone, okay? And then we'll okay. all say it. He is the propitiation. 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 Okay. He is the propitiation, appeasement for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. If you're an enemy to someone and they want to come and execute any kind of punishment against you, because you're on the outside and you're an enemy. You might try appeasement. Now, what is appeasement? There's another big word. How can you, how can you define propitiation by giving me another hard word? What do you mean when you say, I want peace. to appease my enemy? Peace. You want, you want to make peace, tranquility. Make, peace. Um, peace is a good word. You want to you want to do what they want you to do. You try to uh, do it, okay, so that they'll uh, not punish, okay. Did we deserve God's punishment, eternal death? Probably. Yes, we did, by our sin. But Jesus is not only the payment, which we were talking about here, redemption, he is the appeasement and the wrath of God that was owed to us. I don't think you and I can ever understand how angry God is against sin. It's not just a, oh, it's too bad. It's hard living down there. No, he, is, he has been from the beginning of Genesis 3 angry against sin, but he is also full of love for sinners. So he sent his son to be the propitiation, 
to appease his wrath for our sins. Are you getting it now? Yep. To, to take away this anger of God against our sin. Yeah. Um, Pastor, can I say something here uh, in a way? Um, I, I think, you know, when you talk, uh, I think unbelieving, unbelievers don't, don't, they, they will say, well, I'll just go to hell. Excuse, in quotes, I want to say that. Um, and, and don't care. And, and it's to get to the point of caring is the uh, difficult part, or not difficult, but until they see the light is the word, because yeah. uh, they don't see their actions as sin. That's right. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> well, that's enough. When, when you're on the outside looking in, it doesn't seem to be that big of a problem. Or it does sometimes seem to be such a big problem that it's overwhelming. What seems to be? Well, I guess sin and trying to uh, uh, make appeasement for our sins. Like we said, if I don't care, I'll just go to hell. I think it becomes sometimes so overwhelming to, especially maybe someone who does not even know anything about Christ, that they'll say, you know, why should I even care? Why should I even listen to this person? You know, there's no way I can do this. Yes, that, that's true. Without faith, it is impossible to know what God was doing when he sent Christ to be the propitiation, the redemption. It doesn't make sense. The Bible does not appeal to our rational common sense or even our most deep thinking. The Bible appear, uh, appeals and creates faith. And in those who believe, this becomes what is true for them. It's a, it becomes personal. Jesus fully endured the wrath of God, which all mankind had earned by sin. And here in Romans 3.25, Paul uses the same word as John used in 1 John 2. 3.25, God put forward Jesus. The Greek has the pronoun him referring to Jesus as a propitiation that is an appeasement by his blood to be received, and here it is, by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. To pass over is to decide, I will rule on those later. And he would, in the judgment scene, rule in that way. But in the meantime, those who believe in Jesus receive the benefit of Jesus' propitiation. And the only way we can receive it is by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, not ours. We didn't have any. So God put forward Jesus as the one righteous one to be received by faith. Christmas is the celebration of God entering human history in order to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. You can put that on your next Christmas card that you design. You know, these are there's some nice frothy Christmas cards. Uh, Curl and Ives is, was it? Uh, that are they're beautiful, but they don't say anything about the true Christmas. I respect the beauty and the artists and the colors, but I want to know that Christmas is about God entering human history. Jesus reconciled us to God. Someone read Romans 5.10, please. Romans 5, verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Now, someone explain to us, what does it mean to be reconciled? What is reconciliation? Made right. 
Um, Not quite. That's okay. righteousness. That is <laughs> that is the declare the declaration of righteousness. But what is uh, reconciled? To be brought brought back. To be brought to, back. To You're, to uh, forgive differences um, of opinion or there 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 has to be a break and you're brought back into fellowship with that person or okay you're thinking in, on a human level when two parties have been arguing and they reconcile then what happens joanne they're brought back into relationship with each other right because the disagreement broke the relationship that's an excellent parallel to the re relationship of, of people to God. Now, I thought somebody was going to bring up their bank account, which they couldn't reconcile the last time they got a statement. <laughs> they could not bring their numbers into agreement with the banks. And um, one of them was wrong, or it's possible that both of them were wrong, but not likely. And Jeannie said this week, oh, I'm a penny off, and I know where it is. I'm just going to make the adjustment. <laughs> if we were enemies this is a serious reconciliation to be enemies of god how is anybody ever going to be able to reconcile the differences between sinful enemies and the most holy god and the only way it is is by the death of his son so paul is saying while we were enemies, we were reconciled. Now that we are reconciled, we are saved by his life. Both the death and the life of Jesus apply to us. That's probably something you hadn't thought about. I think everyone that is in the Zoom room right now can say, Jesus died for me. Yes, he also lives for me. And I have his life. It's been given to me. It's eternal. It doesn't end. Praise be to God. All of this is worked by faith. Uh, all of this is received by faith. And it is the work of the Holy Spirit. So you must understand, when I ask you, do you understand? I'm really not ap appealing uh, to your rational self-interest. I'm appealing to your faith. And you believe this. When you read, sit down and read cover to cover, if you try to do it, um, let's say you decided to read the book of Romans, the letter of Paul to the Roman Christians, you would probably find a chapter a day, some difficult reading. The other way to read the Bible, the way we're doing it now is has its difficulties, but it's valuable for us in that we're plucking out the passages that pertain to the one doctrine we're trying to teach. You see the difference between reading through the book and uh, understanding or believing what God has said to you in that, in that letter, and for this example, that you, you slow down and you look at this one passage and well, what does this mean? We were reconciled to God. All right. So we're pausing for a moment to consider this question, uh, why Jesus had to be true man. All right. I wonder if you can think of some other reasons that Jesus became true man in the incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas? Um, I think it's from unbelievers that can't muster up faith or something like that. Well, faith is a gift of God. That's nothing, nothing that we muster up. Oh, um, right. Sorry. I can't. I, 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 I knew a man once who said, I, I would like to believe, but I can't. And I said to him, it's not something you do. It's created in you. Yes. When is that going to happen? I said, I don't know, but I pray <laughs> it will. 
I, I think too, it, um, it fulfilled the prophecy of the Old Testament and those that believed in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, we, we pray that it would have brought them to the light of knowing Jesus Christ. Now we know there are still those that um, are still waiting for Christ to come uh, from who believe in the Old Testament, but they don't quite believe in Jesus having come in the New Testament. But um, the more you study back and forth, you, you just see prophecy and Jesus' birth and life all over the Old Testament. Yes, the light comes in after faith has come. Mm -hmm. And there's so many mentions in the Old Testament that I see that <coughs> has the word right hand, mm -hmm. and he's sitting on the right hand of God. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, wow. That's right. Uh, the right hand has to do with the power, not a place. He's not, he's not fastened there. It's, it's not as though he was on a uh, throne next to the Father's throne. Yeah. That's no, not the picture that you sh should have. There are no, nine passages which refer to uh, Jesus' ascension to the right hand of God. I think his coming as a baby, too. We as human beings... Um, he made us that some of us visually have to see things and so many people saw him born and his life and his preaching and what he went through through the crucifixion and then the resurrection afterwards those were all things many many folks saw saw felt touched him and um that helps i think helps us to believe when we can actually be uh, the witnesses Right. Do it. Well, when you read the Gospels, as we have studied them, and uh, you've read through them, I think, um, once or twice, and you've heard sermons and Bible studies on the, the person of Jesus, as you've, you met him, as he did these things. Mm -hmm. Now, when you think about Jesus becoming human, what things about uh, what the Gospels tell you inform your faith and tell you about the humanity of Jesus. What do you see there as you watch him? For example, you, you saw him at the wedding of Cana, turning water into wine, a miracle. But you also saw his compassion. Mm -hmm. Now, when you see the humanity of Jesus, you see what God wants in our humanity that we have compassion upon those who have needs, and to the extent that we are able, we try to fulfill them in, in part. Okay, I, don't, I can't feed the world, but I can feed my neighbor. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what other things about Jesus in the Gospels uh, show you his humanity? He was a mediator between the people and God. And uh, that was important. Yes, he was a mediator. And, and he also felt the things that we felt. I mean, he was sad when his friend died. He, uh -huh. it, he, he, had our, he, he knew how being a human felt and yes. portrayed how we should, like you said, how we should how we should be. Right. He, 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 he wept over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those sent to you. How often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathereth her chicks and you would not. And he wept. Um. The sorrow of, of, of seeing people lost. Go go ahead, Chris. Okay. Um, something that just came to my mind about him being human, or maybe not, in this case that I'm going to mention, and that was, um, um, it's not Brutus. Who's the guy? <laughs> I can't remember his name. You know who I'm. Judas. 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 Yeah, I'm saying uh, it's my brain. I'm sorry. And so he he didn't condemn Judas because he knew and and that that is a, a I mean we don't hear that he did and he he knew that was part of his program 
And, but again, it's, it's a forgiving thing that he had, which was maybe superhuman. And it's, it's also a lesson, even though Judas uh, condemned his own self. But um, do you find anything in that as, as a, a reason to um, a human qualities he wants in us? <clears throat> well, the sentences that come uh, from Jesus to Judas are puzzling to us. Yeah. One of the most puzzling is um, what you what you do do quickly. Jesus uh -huh. knew it was God's plan. That did not mitigate the sin of Judas. Yeah. And if Judas had repented, he would have been forgiven. But okay. instead of repenting, he died in his remorse in his sorrow over his own terrible, terrible sin of betraying the son of man with a kiss. Yes. And, uh, but there are no sentences that I know of Jesus to Judas about forgiveness. I see. He knew who would betray him. <laughs> and that was revealed at the supper, at the Passover supper. Mm -hmm. So we have those details, and we have Jesus' knowledge, but we don't have a uh, forgiveness. What we what we can surmise, and I hate to surmise in an area like this. Yeah. <laughs> but the surm what I might surmise, if I weren't trying to teach a Bible class, is Judas knew why Jesus had come. Because that was clear in the teaching that Jesus gave to all 12 disciples. So that's where I'm going to stop rather than um, try to, to, to surmise. Mm -hmm. Now we're in at about uh, 50 minutes and I have been going over an hour. Uh, I think it was an hour and three minutes last week. I don't find that out until I... Uh, send the send the file uh, uh, to Mr. Ash Aaron. So because there's a break here, and the next topic is why was it necessary that Jesus Christ be true God? And there are about twelve or fourteen slides on that. Rather than jump into that and then uh, uh, do that in the middle. I think it'd be wise that we we close after thinking about the reality of of Christmas. The the reality of Christmas um, that is well, it's different this year, isn't it? Yeah, it, yeah, mm -hmm. it is. And it is so different this year. Yeah, we're all here together in in uh, three by three. <laughs> It's kind of nice. It's usually we don't have. I have even found this year, I don't, I don't know if it's just me, uh, because I haven't been out to that many stores. It's mainly the grocery store. But in previous years, we, we had people saying Merry Christmas or at least Happy Holidays. I don't even hear Happy Holidays this year um, uh, initiated by anybody. Um, I don't know if everybody is just, you know, like the sermons have been on joy and I think we have to remember to keep the joy in the holiday. And so uh, once, a per, you know, once I say Merry Christmas, then it does enlighten a person or I ask what faith tradition they are because we're in Hanukkah also. And uh, then, you know, it seems to brighten them up, but in general, people just seem to be a little more, I don't know, quiet or reserve or, I don't know. Or depressed. Uh, you know, I'm going to no, use the word depressed because I think a lot of people are because of the situations. So much, so much has, you know, I, I think uh, we're all wanting to uh, take 2020 and send it back. But, you know, every moment of this past year is a gift of God. And I'm yeah. not trying to oversimplify it. I'm not because uh, I've suffered the same things that you have, and uh, I hope you don't mind me doing this because I want to go back to this. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to this, dear people, because 
this is all there is. When you say Christmas, the birth of Christ, and the reason, okay, when you have that, you have all that you, you need, okay? And when you say Merry Christmas, the word Merry has to do with more than froth and laughter and all of the good things under the tree and what I didn't get, I wish I had gotten. No, 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 no. Christmas is receiving what you didn't deserve. That you are receiving this, what you did not deserve. It was God's idea. It was God's idea. Lord God, uh, bring us. Hello. Bring us to the manger. Wrong number. So we might see Jesus the Christ. Yes. Your son. And then after a pause at the manger, bring us to the cross. Where uh, the wood of the tree is the means by which you reconcile us to yourself, not counting our trespasses against us. We are so grateful. We are so grateful, oh God, because you decided to love us in this special way. Merry Christmas. <laughs>